Hello, uh, and welcome to Oregon Humanities uh, Consider This program. My name is Adam Davis. Uh, before I do anything else, I want to say a big welcome to David Troyer. David? Hey. Thanks so much. It's really hey. great. Yeah, I wish it was in person, to be honest, but, you know, we do what we can. We do what we can, and again, maybe down the road we'll be able to do that. Uh, we invited you in. You're in Minnesota. I'm going to ask you more about that in a minute. Um, I think we're looking forward to talking about things like land, sovereignty, treaties, maybe culture, uh, through the lens at least a bit of parks and who, who they belong to and, and who manages them. Um, we're going to spend an hour, the two of us or so, talking together. And then I want to invite viewers to join in through the Zoom link that you see on your screen and that you saw when you registered in order to talk to each other in small groups facilitated by my coworker at Oregon Humanities, Roselle Medina. I do wanna say that we looked at the registration list earlier today and we had over 400 people sign up for this. And in those 400 people, we saw folks from more than 65 towns and cities in Oregon as well as numerous other places around the country and some out of the country. And so, David, I just want to let you know that uh, that's, that's on account of you and what you're writing about and thinking about. Thank you. Uh, and it's really exciting to see. It's also, we invite people to share questions, and I just want to say at the beginning, the questions, just really wonderful questions that came in. And in this conversation, we're going to try to incorporate as many of those questions as we can. Thank you for putting thought into those in advance. Last thing before we jump in, I want to thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Oregon Cultural Trust, the City of Portland's We Are Better Together program, Northwest Natural, Tonkin Torp, Stoll Reeves, and the Kinsman Foundation for helping make this and other events possible. Um, so thank you to all those organizations. So, um, David, it was the cover article in The Atlantic that inspired us to reach out to you, but I, the cover article about returning the national parks to Native American tribes. But before jumping too much into that article, I, I wanna, since so much of that is about land and place and relationship to it, I wonder in this virtual world, if you could sort of tell us where you're calling in from and what it feels like for you to be there. Oh yeah. I'm. Um calling in from the Leech Lake Reservation where I'm from. I'm Ojibwe from Northern Minnesota. Leech Lake is is the reservation that I was raised on, it's where my family's from. And um, I'm back in the only place I consider home. Um, I don't get to spend as much time here as I'd like, but I'm back for a good stretch. And I'm actually in the house I grew up in, which after my father passed away, passed to me. And I'm, hmm actually in his old office, in his old office chair. And uh, so it's, I don't know how many of the viewers, you know, are familiar with Minnesota or Northern Minnesota in particular, but it's beautiful. It's just it's a wet environment, it's green. We have swamps and bogs and lakes and rivers. I'm a stone's throw from the Mississippi and uh, you know, my kids are upstairs, their cousins who live just a little ways through the woods. Um, then they walked over here, you know, they walk through the woods to each other's houses in the summer and they spend the entire summer together. And, and it's, um, it's good to be home here. Mm -hmm. It's great. And thank you for joining us from there. And you split your time between there and California. I do. Um, I teach at USC during the academic year um, and I make it back here for probably four months out of the year in total. Um, it's, it's always been hard for me. Like I, when I live up here full time, I go a little stir crazy. I live back on the reservation full time and I, I miss being kind of in the mix out in other parts of the world. And when I live in other parts of the world, I'm just homesick for here. Yeah. And so uh, finding the right balance has always been sort of my life's, my life's sort of goal. I haven't quite achieved it yet. <laughs> Um, in a couple of books you've written that precede the Atlantic piece, uh, you talk a lot about the West um, and what made the West the West. And it's interesting to think about you going back and forth 
from Leech Lake out to Los Angeles. And um, it's also incredibly interesting to think about you being in your father's study. It actually puts me in mind of the speech from Chief Joseph, who's from out in these parts. Um, this The line about any man who doesn't what is it about the father's grave is like a wild animal. Hmm. I don't know if that line is ringing a bell for you. I, I can find it exactly and yeah. bring it's it back. It's ringing but... a bell. I put the whole speech yeah. in the book, so it's like yeah. all there. You know. What I want to ask about is uh, that th being in your father's office, being surrounded by family, uh, how much does that feel to you like that's a deliberate choice? And what drives it if it is a deliberate choice? I mean, it's, it's got to be deliberate, right? I mean, when I was 17, I was leaving home to go to college. You know, I swore up and down, I'm, I'm getting the hell out of here and I'm never coming back. I'm getting out of the reservation. I'm getting out of the town of Bemidji where I went to high school. Um, I'm getting out of the north. I'm out. And within months, if not weeks, I yearned for it, you know, and I, I yearned for sort of the only place that really made sense to me. And I mean that in terms of landscape, but also in terms of kinship and culture, like, and I don't know how to describe it. I try to tell friends, like, this isn't a diss on California native homelands by any stretch, but in California, like, I don't feel like I have any relationship with the land as much time as I spend camping and hiking and out in the desert, you know, maybe a Joshua tree with my kids and, and with people from there, I don't feel like the land recognizes me and I certainly don't recognize it. And it feels almost like an antagonistic relationship that I have with that landscape. Like it could care less about me. It couldn't care less. Whereas here, I feel like there is a relationship and I feel it, it feels reciprocal. I care about this place and I feel like it also in its own way cares about me. Mm -hmm. And that's unique to the North for me, to this place. That feels like, uh, it feels like a step toward the argument about parks, maybe a small step and maybe I can mm -hmm. push a little further there. It sounded like what you were saying was you belong to the land and the land to some extent belongs to you. Yeah. yeah. Can I ask one more question? Like, what does it mean yeah. for you to belong to the land or the land to belong? When you hear that, I mean, even the subtitle of your piece in the Atlantic is the jewels of America's landscape should belong to America's original peoples. And I just want to ask about that word belong and what yeah. you hear in I mean, that's, that subtitle for the Atlantic piece is a broad statement, and it's almost like a policy-esque statement. You know, the word I used about relating up here was I felt like the land recognizes me. It acknowledges mm -hmm. me um, and vice versa. Ownership and belonging are, are kind of different things, you know. Um, but it's funny, like, just look at personal anecdote, you know, family story. Like when I was a kid, my mom was very successful. My mom is native, my dad's not. And my mom came from very humble origins to become um, an attorney. And she grew up in a two room shack in the village of Bina, this tiny village of 140 people, which is mostly my family on the Leech Lake Reservation. They had electricity, but they didn't have running water. She had to walk to the well down the hill, pump the water, carry it back. They heated it up on a wood stove. Um, she grew up hard in ways that I can't possibly understand because I didn't grow up that hard. She went on to become an attorney and uh, the first Native American woman judge in the country. Um, she was really impressive. But when we were kids, we were forced, and, and I'm not using that word carelessly. We were forced. In the fall, I was forced to harvest wild rice. Mm. And then later in the fall, I was forced to hunt. And then in the spring, I was forced to tap and uh, 
uh, tap maple trees and make maple sugar and syrup. In the summer, I was forced to pick berries. And I say forced because I hated all that crap when I was a kid. Hated it. And my mom, like, a lot of people do those things. And they do them because they have to. Because wild rice crop is a staple food source and people are so poor, like they rely on the wild rice to survive. And they hunt because meat is expensive and they can't afford it. And so they hunt to fill their freezers, you know, same with berries and maple syrup is a more niche, I suppose. But so when I was done with all of that and I was like out of college and I was desperate to come back so I could be here for ricing season, so I could be here for hunting season, so I could be here for, for sugaring down not so much picking berries. I never really learned to like that very much. Um, I would, I would, I yearned to do these things with my brothers and my sister and my cousins and, you know, extended family. And I asked her, I'm like, why did you make us do this stuff when I was a kid? You didn't have to, you could buy rice, you can afford meat, you know? She's like, well, I wanted to make sure that you knew how to survive the way that we'd always survived. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, the world went to hell out there, and if you failed out there, you could at least come home and you could feed yourself, clothe yourself, you know, you'd be okay. And I was like, wow. I mean, she was deep gaming the whole thing, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> But it's interesting. I wondered if she was going to go in a different direction as you laid that story out. I wondered if you were going to, if you were going to say that she had an argument about connection to each other or no, culture, building, it was, but the argument was a survival. Not really, argument. Not, that wasn't her argument. That wasn't it. I mean, those things happened, you know, but I think without, without being raised that way, I wouldn't have the, the connection I have. I wouldn't have that sense of reciprocity with the place that I'm from, you know? And one thing, and this can lead us into talking about parks if you want, um, you know, we were unfortunate as Ojibwe people in lots of ways. You know, the treaty process, the process of colonization hurt us in many ways. The allotment policy that started in the 1890s or late 1880s, rather, boarding schools, um, all of that stuff that happened to a lot of other tribes happened to us, too, and was really destructive. But we were fortunate enough to, for example, there are Ojibwe communities on the three largest, most important life-sustaining lakes in the state. On Mille Lacs Lake, Red Lake, or four, Leech Lake, and Lake Superior. <laughs> you know, we, we were able to remain in our homelands, and so we had access to the fish that sustained us, wild rice, <laughs> and things like that. So we were really fortunate compared to some other tribes who were displaced or relocated, you know? Um, and it's with that in mind that I approached this piece about national parks. Not all tribes were that lucky. Right. When they created Yellowstone, Shoshone, Bannock, Crow, and other tribes from that region were, were promised that they could still exercise their treaty rights. They could still travel through, hunt, gather, et cetera, in the park. Those promises, those assurances uh, were quickly forgotten and natives were actively barred from entering parklands. You know, ditto for the Blackfeet, you know, and the subsequent creation of Glacier National Park in the early, early 20th century. Um, and this story was repeated throughout. I mean, um, Miwok people and other tribes in the Yosemite Valley were punted out of the valley. Some remained, but very few. You know, um, and so, and those tribes suffered immeasurably and in different ways than we did because they didn't have access and they didn't have the land to keep practicing both the things that sustained them calorically, mm -hmm. but also that sustained them culturally. So a lot right there. Yeah. Um, and maybe I can ask about two things. One is in the very brief account you just gave of tribes being pushed out of the lands that they lived off and lived in. I mean, in a way, the story beneath that is a story about war. Uh, and, and you say there's a very potent sentence in the piece about the West beginning in war, the American West started in war, 
and ends in parks. And maybe I can just stay there for a minute and ask about that because it's a short, really powerful. Here's the story. Here's how the American West starts war and look at what it is now parks. Yeah. So I guess I want to ask about that juxtaposition and then how that move leads to the suggestion that you make in the piece. Yeah, I mean, Black Elk um, had an even more pithy way of putting it in. I don't know if it was in Black Elk Speaks or in an interview he gave, but he's like, yeah, the white man, you know, came to the our homelands and they made little boxes to put all the four-legged creatures in. Those are national parks. It made other separate boxes to put the Indians in, and those are reservations. And what's interesting is that the park process, starting with Yellowstone in the early 1870s, um, exactly paralleled the reservation process. Mm -hmm. um, you know, parks were starting to be made right when treaty making was ending in the 1870s. And now, so in, the, in the period of time from the 1870s to the, to the present moment, over roughly 90 million acres were transferred into parks and national parks and national monuments and historic sites. The same exact time period from the 1870s to the present, tribes around the country lost an identical amount of land, around 87 million acres transferred out of native control and into white control through various government programs and policies like allotment and things like termination, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and um, one of the funny things, this is a little sidebar, but you know, we were talking before you know, everyone else was logging on to watch about comments I've gotten for the Atlantic article. And there were some surly, silly, like sound bitey rejections of my modest proposal. And it is modest. Um, that all the national parks and monuments be returned to a consortium of native tribes to manage on behalf of all Americans and park visitors. Um, someone said something to the effect of native people lost, get over it. You know, and I actually, I don't respond to comments very often, but um, I responded to that one. And I'm like, don't you think you're calling the game a little early? You may be done fighting. So if you surrender, I accept, but we're not done. You think we're done? We're not done. We even stopped. You know, yeah. we're still at it. I feel like that's a big part of your argument in the two nonfiction books that we've already touched on a little bit is your your argument is, uh, look, actually, we're moving towards thriving even more. And there have been steps which you yourself sound surprised by. But I wondered. And so so casinos, for example, figure in in an important way from a small sure. court case to wealth generation, not in every case, but in a significant right. number of cases, they create their own problems sometimes, but they've also helped build power. So in a way, I guess I want to ask about your sense of uh, flourishing among the tribes yeah. here. Well, Go the on. numbers don't lie, you know, as of 1890, which was kind of a watershed moment, that's when the, the frontier was declared officially closed. There were a couple parks created before 1890, but really the movement took off around that time. Around the time they figured that, you know, nature was disappearing. The American landscape was being eroded by business and development and logging and mining and so on. Not untrue, it was, it was disappearing. Um, that same year, 1890, the census, the story the census told was there were roughly 220,000 native people left alive in the United States. Um, down from a population at first contact between 15 and 30 million. You know, dark times. We were like American nature, I suppose, in danger of being snuffed out. But as of today, as of the last census, and this new one will be interesting to read once it's all compiled and published, there were over 5 million people who identified as native in the United States, up from 220,000 130 years ago, or 20 years. That's a resurgence, that's a boom. There are more native people in the United States than there are people who identify as Jewish American in the United States. There are twice as many people who identify as native 
as there are people who identify as Muslim American. Those are important numbers to recognize, you know, yeah. that we have, we are growing. We are growing at a faster clip than any other demographic in this country. So in places like Montana, it's hard because lots of Californians are moving there and it's kind of annoying. But North Dakota, for sure, maybe South Dakota, it's conceivable that in 100 years, they will be native majority states. White people are having fewer kids and the ones they're having are leaving. Native people are having more kids, not leaving. So, so you yeah, know, so that's native people swung the election in Arizona for Biden. Without the native vote, he wouldn't have won there. So, for example, like we're becoming more and more populous and more and more powerful. Um, so, like, if if you want to surrender, now's a good time. Like, you can just sur people can surrender now and save us all sorts of tension and stress. You know, right. I um, I don't really represent any tribal groups, but I am more than willing to accept the United States surrender um, to the Ojibwe people at this moment. I will give good terms. You know, I'm not going to screw anyone over, um, but I'm, I'm here to accept people surrender if they if they feel like it. So. Yeah, I can't speak on the United States behalf. And it's interesting to think about, in a way, a couple of things you said along the way to this offer. One was you used the verb identify, people who identify as yeah. Native American. And maybe you can stay there for a minute, in part because some of the questions that came in were about the mechanics in a way you propose that the management of the park should go over to a consortium of tribes and there's a complexity to the details which your article doesn't your essay doesn't try to go into and i don't think we should go too much into now in a way as i read your piece you mentioned the word policy before and i don't think it's a policy piece it points toward a policy but it feels like it's before the policy yeah can i ask you a little bit though about the identity Native American, in part because you address it in different ways in the books, uh, blood quantum, language. How do you see Native American identity uh, as a thing? Where do you see the limits and the substance? It's, it's interesting and misunderstood, you know, how identity culture, sort of federal recognition and enrollment and all of that stuff works in the Native context, unlike any other category of people in the United States mm -hmm. to be legally native, which is to be an enrolled member of a federally recognized tribe is a legal political designation. It's a form of citizenship. Mm -hmm. Problematic how it's how one is a citizen or not of a tribe and it varies from tribe to tribe, but most tribes this was per U.S. government policy, determined citizenship based, not based on language, not based on residency, not based on anything other than blood quantum. What percentage of Indian blood you have? And again, it varies. Some tribes, you just need, just need to prove descent. Um, other tribes, you need to be a quarter. Other tribes, you need to be 51%. Other tribes, 50%. Other tribes are, are matrilineal. This is Tonawana Seneca. You're not really Seneca. You're not legally Seneca unless your mom you in, is passed down through your mother's line. So if your mom's not Seneca, you're not Seneca, even though you might be culturally Seneca. And that's, so that's the thing. It's like to be native legally is one thing. To be native culturally is another thing. To have a native identity is yet another thing. You know, so I explain it this way, like identities are always instructed, multiple and overlapping. So me identify as a man as part of my identity as a hetero cisgendered man, I suppose, you know, that's one, one identity overlapping with that is an identity as a native person. Um, on top of that is my identity as a northerner. Mm -hmm. I'm from the north. Um, 
all of those things are constructed. Those are things that I sort of make for myself as a way to understand myself. Culture is not the same as identity. Culture is not in, is not constructed. It's not a willful, conscious way of perceiving oneself. Culture is a web of relationships that you are born into. It's almost like it's almost like being a first language speaker of any language. You don't know the rules. You inherit the rules. You know, most of us, and I'm an English professor, would be hard pressed to sort of lucidly describe the rules that govern my language. Same thing for culture. Culture is a sort of, it's a water you swim in and you don't choose that water, but it shapes shapes so much of who you are. You don't choose your cultures. You don't make your cultures. You're born into them, you know? Um, so that's very different than identity, very different than race. And race is just a, an imaginary construct. It's a category that people usually make for others. <laughs> you know? And then and in the in the modest proposal, which when I hear the phrase modest proposal, I think satire. Swift, right. I'm not satire. I'm for real. <laughs> it, it didn't sound like Swift. It sounded like you were for real about it and building up yeah. to a for real somewhat modest proposal. And also, if we think about the steps to get there, those wouldn't be modest steps. No, but like, you know, in another interviewer, um, you know, not as sort of either genteel or conversational as, as you um, said like, well, this is a really radical proposal. Like what, you know, what, what made you think of having this ra radical proposal? I'm like, you know, I don't think it's very radical, honestly. Mm -hmm. What's radical is to steal land from other people to pretend like you didn't steal it, to then exclude them from it, and then to mismanage it, mismanage it for, for about a hundred years. That to me is radical, you know? Mm -hmm. to, to sort of gift the parks back to a consortium of all the tribes in the United States to manage on behalf of all the people of this country and visitors to it is much less radical than sort of such brazen theft, yeah, you know? And so the, the proposal isn't just, you know, a way to right a historical wrong vis-a-vis -vis native people, although my proposal would do that. Um, it's also a proposal that would help protect the parks as they move into the future. It would be good for the land itself, not just for native people. For instance, um, one of the last things Obama did in office was to enlarge and add protections to the Bears Ears National Monument. Um, and also to Grand Staircase Escalante on the border of Utah and Arizona. Um, it was one of the very last things he did by presidential order. Within two weeks of taking office, Trump undid those and he undid them for one reason only. His very first feud when he became president was with the National Park Service because the National mm -hmm. Park Service manages the National Mall. And it was their duty to report the number of people at Trump's inaugural festivities. So they reported the real numbers, which Trump didn't like because not that many people showed up for the shit show that was his inauguration. Um, so his very first feud is with the Park Service. And so he undid those two things just because he could. So wouldn't it be better for parks if they were protected from the whims of this or that president? You know, and the sort of the shifting sort of the shifting sort of winds of federal policy, wouldn't it be better if this land were protected under a different structure? So that some asset like Trump can't just undo a park because he feels like it? I think it's good for the land and it's good for all Americans. It would be nice, and I say this in the piece, America is, is wrestling right now. And we hear this, this debate being carried on in you know, like arguments around critical race theory. We hear it in arguments around civil rights, but this country is trying to reckon with a complicated, violent, 
unsavory past. It's trying to find a way, at least some people in this country are trying to find a way, as Camus put it, to love one's country and still love justice. Yeah? Okay, so, yeah. And on that point, there's one last thing before your next question. Like, sure. and my proposal would be one way to acknowledge the problems and mistakes and sins, I think we can call them of the past, not to pave over them, recognize them to atone. And so wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be nice to stand in Yellowstone knowing it's protected, to look up at El Capitan or Half Dome and know that you're looking up at Miwok land as well as American land and to know that you're standing once again on native land and, and you're looking up at a mountain, but you're also looking up at the practice of justice. Mm -hmm. That would be profound. Yeah. I yeah. Um, the line from Camus is a strong line that what would it mean to love one's country and still love justice? Um, and that is a, that's the part of your proposal that seems like a moral argument that it is right to return land to not just prior but i think you make the case for original inhabitants not like other immigrants in other places but it, even in the stories that the tribes themselves tell here since here was here mm. that's the argument and that seems like the moral argument but then you also are tying to that a kind of prudential argument that actually you'll manage it better. You'll manage it better that we'll, than we'll manage it. And uh, now that's where like the policy questions start really popping up. Who exactly will manage it? How will people and tribes work together? Um, I, I hope we can get there in a little bit, but I don't think your piece tries to answer those questions and I don't want to yeah. push you too much on them now. Yeah. I want to stick with the moral argument for just an, at least another couple minutes. and. I want to ask about the claim to uh, to land, I don't know if the right word is recognition, belonging, ownership, based on prior habitation. That, that, that argument seems like it can go, it seems like a very, like it's an argument that appeals strongly to me when I hear you make it. And from some groups, that argument feels really right. And from other groups, that argument scares me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can see that. Um, but you could reframe it, right? Okay. And preserve the morality of it, which is that, you know, that which was stolen should be returned. Right? Your kid boosts a 25 cents pack of gum from the, from the store. What do we as parents do? We're like, kid, not cool. You got to go back. You got to give it back. You got to apologize. You know? Yeah. I yeah. mean, I think what's for, for instance, like on Leech Lake, you know, we suffered. So if, for those of you, the viewers who don't know, the federal government had this genius idea of how are we going to help the Indian? Well, you know, the way to make an Indian civilized is to teach them to be civilized. The main way you do that is by owning things. So instead of, you know, instead of the land within the reservation boundaries, you know, being held in common by the tribe, that's backwards and savage and stupid. It's holding, reservations are holding Indians back. What you really need to do is give Native people the chance to own a plot of land and to work it. You know, so that was the allotment policy. So on my reservation, which is roughly 40 by 40 square miles, 40 miles by 40 miles, so it's, it's more than that. Um, they allotted individual parcels. I, I can't remember if it was, I think it was 80 acres or maybe sometimes 120 to every head of household. And then once that was done, they're like, what to do with the surplus land? Because there was more land then there were people to, to give it to, you know? Okay. Well, then we'll just open that up to, to white people. They can buy it and they can live there. They can homestead it, you know? So the result of this policy 
which we didn't like and which we were coerced into agreeing with and which we were sort of at a moment of incredible political weakness, you know, kind of forced to adopt. 10% of the land within the boundaries of my reservation is owned by the tribe and owned by native people, individually. 10%. 10%. So when I moved to California, I'm like, I'm not moving to California unless I got a foot back on the res. And so I bought a little house at the end of this dirt road on a lake, right like two, three miles from where I grew up that I really love. And when I was getting my mortgage, like a good American, you know, um, you know, they have to do uh, title research. That bit of land, moved from native control to a white owner in about 1903, right during allotment, mm -hmm. right back at. And I was the first Indian to own it in a hundred years. You know? And this is so, true on many, many reservations, oh, that yes, situation. Yeah, of course. It's true in most reservations. There's only some notable exceptions like Navajo Nation, Red Lake, some others that, that successfully fought allotment and the land is held in common. Very few reservations were successful like those ones were in, in fighting and some others were too. Other reservations were completely terminated in Oregon, in Wisconsin, other places. So, you know, like, so yeah, like here first, you know, can, can get a sinister anti-immigrant kind of flavor. Absolutely. I mean, I hear what you're saying. So there's other ways to think about it, you know, um, and that might make well, it both palatable and less, less sort of frisky, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, okay. that's what I, I like that word frisky in this instance. Um, <laughs> I, I, th I actually think title to land is complicated. Yeah. Uh, like it's hard to make it simple and that's really what I think I'm trying to ask about is what should yeah. a claim to land be based on and what should the status of that claim be? Does it mean ownership well, or does it mean something else? Right. I mean, even if, right, even if the United States only at the, at the minimum honored its treaty commitments to the tribes it signed treaties with, if it only did that much, mm -hmm. that would be huge. Mm -hmm. So for example, if the Lakota were once again, the possessors of only the land that was remained unseated at the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie, mm -hmm. would mean that they would own the Eastern, or sorry, the Western third of South Dakota in some parts of North Dakota, Wyoming, and Montana. All those lands were illegally taken from the Lakota. All of them. And they won in court. The Supreme Court, I think in 1980, decided and ruled in favor of the Lakota, saying, yes, indeed, this land should be yours. Instead of getting it back, they're like, here's a bunch of money. And the Lakota are like, we don't want it. We want the land. We are not going to settle for cash, period. The cash is still sitting in an account. It's still there because the government's unwilling to undo the effects of its theft. You know, what about the poor white people living in Rapid City or, you know, the Black Hills or whatever? Well, you know, they can go to the government for redress. Yeah. In my opinion. Yeah. So again, I, what so I should have said at the start, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So like if, if, at a minimum, if they just honor treaties, that would be something, you know? Yeah. Um, so but I, I will say this, I, I, this is patently obvious to me and to most Native people that I know, that we are really good at honoring the treaties that we sign and by abiding by their terms. U.S. government, not so much. But the fact is, and this, these are the words of, of, a, of a Canadian native person, not my words. I wish they were because they're brilliant. But he said, like, we made treaties, native people made treaties with the government in, in order to find a way to live together. Mm -hmm. The government made treaties with tribes 
as a way not to. Mm. That simple. Yeah. So were the parks to be gifted back to a consortium of tribes, we have a pretty good track record of, of honoring our word and honoring our treaty. Yeah. You know, we have a pretty, pretty, good, pretty good track record doing that. Okay, so a couple things in that too. One is the complexity of federal government, state governments, sovereign tribal nations, government. Yeah. tribal government within. And uh, you point to a couple places where you talk about, I think, uh, sovereign domestic and also sovereign dependent nation and the complexity of those yeah. two things happening at the same time. And that's a complicated language. It's that's a legal language that originated from a trilogy of Supreme Court cases in the 1820s and 30s, um, majority opinion authored by Chief Justice John Marshall as a way of describing the unique relationship between tribes and the US government. And he referred to tribes as domestic dependent nations. Mm -hmm. And so we're sovereign. And that's been the, that's been the language that has sort of enabled both tribes to continue to exist, but also empower the US government to continue to try and take from us. Try, I should say, not always yeah. succeed taking from yeah. us. Because it's the domestic dependent nationhood status which makes things so complicated. Those weren't our understandings of ourselves. Right. They were just Chief Justice John Marshall's words. Yeah. Um, and they've been words that sort of in terms of federal Indian policy that the government has leaned on for a good 190 years. Not great words, you know, but you know, it's complex. So were the tribes to come back to tribes, it would be complex, but you know what? You know what has also happened since this country was founded? 37 other states have been admitted to the union. That was complicated, but they did it. You know, you know what else has happened? We gave the Panama Canal back to the country of Panama. Certainly complicated, but that happened. And then further afield, you know what else has happened? The British gifted Hong Kong and gave it sovereignty, you know, back to the, back to the citizens of that nation now it's very complicated now with China, mainland China and Hong Kong, it's very complicated. But these complicated administrative changes of character and scenery have happened many times. You know, we can put a guy in the moon, Elon Musk can go to Mars, we can figure this out. Okay. We can figure it out. Not that and that to me, yeah, and that to me is where, that's why I don't want and didn't want to push too much into the details because right. it feels like, Really what you're arguing is those details are plenty figure outable. The question is, do we want to do this? Is there an argument for it that is persuasive? I want to bump back from that. Yeah, no, you, you, do, a, you do a pretty good job uh, here um, and on paper. And I, I do think the books before it also really, I, I just want to encourage people that are viewing, um, read Res Life read Heartbeat of Wounded Knee. I think the article is a kind of logical extension of it, but the, the depth of those um, to, to get to that argument, it makes me want to push back to the Camus quote again, and also to, for example, treaties and the way they seem to be functioning in different ways, depending on which side of the treaty you were on. Um, right. You end res life with your grandfather's funeral a scene at your grandfather's funeral. And you talk about he's being buried. It's a Catholic ceremony. Mm -hmm. He's being buried in Indian land. Mm -hmm. And there are two flags raised. One is the Leech Lake Reservation flag and one is the United States of America flag. And that you're kind of thinking about those two flags as the book ends. In a way, I think I'm asking a question about that, about those flags, especially. What are you asking? I'm like, asking about I'm asking about patriotism, to use a kind of archaic word that actually yeah. Native Americans have demonstrated by, for example, incredibly high percentage of people serving in the military. Oh yeah, that's a fact so that blows people. 
Yeah. yeah, and so I just want to ask about the status of patriotism among Native Americans given what you describe gently as unsavory along the way. Um, outsiders think of this as deeply ironic, but it doesn't feel ironic to Native people. I mean, at least not the people that I know or the people in my family and people I talk to. Like, Native people are deeply patriotic dual citizens. Mm -hmm right? Citizens of our tribal nations, which exist inside of the American Republic. That's not a contradiction for most Native people. My grandfather was incredibly patriotic, proud to have been a, a veteran of World War II, a combat veteran. Um, deeply patriotic. Um, wasn't a contradiction for him to be a native man from Leech Lake Reservation, you know, from the Ojibwe Nation or one of them, and uh, and to be an American at the same time, you know, this country grew up around our native nations. It didn't extinguish them. It's very hard for people to understand, really, you know, and as you noted. And this drives people, people just, their eyes go wide. Native people have served in every war that America has fought in numbers exponentially higher than any other demographic by choice, not by draft. You know, my grandfather and two of his brothers, he had all volunteered for World War II, well before they would have been drafted. And they each served in a different branch because my, my great grandmother's like, if you're all going to join up, then you're all going to be in different branches. There's a better chance of more of you coming home. They all came home, shockingly. One in the Navy, one in the Air Force, my grandfather in this, this second division, U.S. Infantry. But um, it's not surprising. And this is the thing that I, I, I argue for less overtly in res life and more clearly in the heartbeat of wounded knee is that America has always has, has grown up and only makes sense in relation to native people and, and native history, you know? And I can give like a rapid fire little thing, which, you know, but like, like not only did we serve with the revolutionary forces, not only did Oneida native people break the famine at Valley Forge and teach Washington and his troops, how to how to get nutrition from Indian corn. You know, the very first treaty that the United States signed was with the Delaware. And one of the provisions of that treaty was promising that they could enter the Union as the 14th state if they protected America's Western frontier from British incursions, like an end around through the Great Lakes and from behind, which the Delaware did and prevented the British from attacking us on two fronts. After the Revolutionary War, when the, the government was looking around for a new form of government, like what kind of government do we want to have that's never before been seen on earth that's a true democracy, to whom did they turn for inspiration? They turned to the Iroquois Confederacy. And it's on them that our separation of powers was modeled. The judicial, you know, the judiciary, the executive, and the legis legislative. That was from the Iroquois. You know? So from the beginning, America came to be what it is in relation to, not in spite of native tribes. This extends to the modern day. Like between 1965 and 1995, the United States Supreme Court heard more cases about federal Indian law than any other genre of law. More than civil rights, more than reproductive rights, more than women's rights, more than immigration, more than banking. So as America was trying to reimagine itself during and after the civil rights, Vietnam War, Pentagon Papers, Watergate. It did so at least in the courts in relation to the question of native sovereignty. Even more recently, like, you know, the fight over the Dakota Access Pipeline and Keystone XL and now over Line 3 in Minnesota, pipeline fights are not fights of like the white man trying to destroy Indians again. These are native people fighting for all Americans. The fight there is not over 
pipelines or not pipelines, but over what's more important, the common good or corporate profit. And it's Native people who are fighting that fight on behalf of all Americans. So from the beginning to now, America doesn't make sense unless you think of it in relation to Native lives being lived now and Native history. It doesn't make sense. And I think that was the unspoken part of my question about patriotism, that it feels yeah. like the, the suggestion that the parks be returned to the management of the tribes is also an offer. That it's an offering to do something for the country. Uh, that some of the country's past treatment of the tribes makes a little hard to understand. Why make an offer? But you, you've just made an argument for the uh, the continued practice of that offering and that there's nothing contradictory about it. You also yeah. just made an argument about uh, not being able to understand America without understanding what's going on in this relationship. Can I ask just about the, do the principles of this suggestion and this argument extend to other places for you? Or is there something really unique about what's going on here? Principles about the, I mean, especially around indigeneity and return. Yeah. Is this, is um, there a, yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I quite understand the question. In a way, I want to ask, uh, like, could we say your argument for the parks and what that, that argument rests on about prior habitation and a certain way of stewarding the lands? Mm -hmm. Would you be comfortable making that argument wherever it happens, in whatever part of the world you see a similar situation, or is there something really exceptional about the relationship between the tribes that had been here and the U.S. government that formed that makes this argument especially salient here? I don't know. I mean, similar things to my proposal have already happened in other places, um, in New Zealand and in Australia in particular. Um, there's a river in New Zealand which was just um, recognized as having a personhood. So all the protections an individual human person has, that river now has, for instance, you know, huge areas in, in New Zealand were returned to Maori communities and, and Maori governments um, for them to manage like national parks, like on behalf of, you know, all the people of New Zealand, same thing in Australia. So it's already happened in other places, you know? But I would say this, that the United States is a unique creature, you know? And it's not a very popular thing to say, which that doesn't make it untrue to say that this country, its existence is founded on taking native land, to, so like expropriating native land to be then improved and monetized by expropriating the freedom of African-American human beings by enslaving them to work the land stolen from native people. All financed with Northern money in New York City. So that's, that's how this country was literally built on land stolen from tribes and worked by enslaved African people. Until we reckon with that, so, so like this whole like, you know, like culture war that sort of the right is trying to start, you know, it's a good war to have because you can't understand this country's founding documents, which refer in the Declaration of Independence refers to Native people as merciless Indian savages. Yeah. Like you can't understand the Declaration of Independence or the subsequent Constitution without understanding and engaging with critical race theory. They're racial documents that disempower enslaved African-Americans and push us and exclude us from the provisions of the constitution initially. We didn't count. All of the protections of the Bill of Rights and all that stuff didn't apply to us. We were outside of it. You know, so yeah, I mean, similar arguments and similar things are, are actually already happening in other places, but also America is uniquely different than certainly than European nations. 
European nations didn't have frontiers, they had colonies. America incorporated its colonies inside of itself and then it was just imperialistic, you know, worldwide. Um, yeah. So it's a different, it's a different place than other places. It's unique. Yeah. Yeah. So it's unique in lots of different ways, probably <laughs> not unique in that the challenge that Camus posed is true probably in every country. That is the challenge sure. of a, of an unjust past and the hope to love the country while looking at that injustice. And so right. sort of here, you've given us this proposal to take a meaningful, practical, reparative step toward justice. Uh, you also talk about a couple words we haven't talked about as much, and maybe they're a place to move towards a close. One of those words sure. is access, and another one is dignity. They both seem to be core to the suggestion. And maybe I can just ask you uh, yeah. around access and especially around dignity, what you're thinking about how this suggestion with the parks would move in those directions. Yeah, like when I talked to park people, the employees of the National Park Service, when I was researching this article, I talked with them a lot about access. And they said, well, Native people can come and enjoy the parks. I'm like, yeah, but they're allowed to enjoy them as we would enjoy them. They're, we're allowed to enjoy them just the same way that non-Native people are. Like I, a Shoshone Bannock person can't go to Yellowstone and drop a bison. Mm -hmm. You know, I think maybe they should be allowed to do that. You know, or when they call the Yellowstone herd, shouldn't those bison go to Native people first? Mm. It's theirs. Still, Shoshone Bannock Crow and other tribes in the area. You know, like. I'm like, we can access the parks, but that access does, the kind of access that we're allowed to have follows a cultural script, which is not ours. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so that was important. That was hard for them to understand when I was sort of pushing back against them when I was interviewing park people around those issues. I'm like, I'm like, it's not enough that I can, pay my small fee, which I'm happy to pay. It's 80 bucks for a pass that gets you into all the national parks around the country for a year. That's a small price. I'm happy to pay it. I can afford it, you know, no problem. But, you know, should I have to? Can I go to Voyager National Park in Minnesota and hunt ducks and harvest rice? And uh, too many maple trees in Voyager National Park, to be honest, so I won't be tapping trees up there. But, I should be able to exercise my, my treaty rights to hunt, fish, gather, travel, live. Shouldn't I? You know, I never gave up that land. My tribe never gave up that land and it was stolen. So access that's deserved. Access is, yeah, you know, something to think about. And in terms of like, what was the second term? You know, the, the big term dignity, which is maybe what yeah. I want to, yeah. You know how, like, you're a father, you know? You know how, like, when your kid does something and does something wrong and they carry themselves differently mm -hmm. when they know they've done something wrong. It's like they've, they've been bad and it's almost like a weight around their necks. Their postures changes. You know, mm -hmm. they act, they lash out because they, they lost their dignity for a moment and in a small way, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, and it's up to us as their parents to help them regain it by recognizing what they've done by owning it and moving on. Mm -hmm. You know, when I look out at this country, and I look out at sort of, it's in aggregate, you know? But when I look out in particular recently, like at the state of Texas mm -hmm. in their efforts to sort of restrict voting rights and restrict women's rights to choices over their own bodies. When I see Trump's behavior, when I see sort of, I see a country dying to regain 
and find its own dignity. And unable, unable to find a way to get it back. And suffering as a result, suffering all sorts of agonies over racial, racial and economic justice, over reproductive rights, over all sorts of things. And it makes me incredibly sad that like my grandfather, this country I love, and I love this country, you know? I love the United States of America, you know? Probably not quite as much as I love my tribe, but still, um, you know? I, it makes me incredibly sad to see the shape it's in, yeah. you know? And I feel like I, I'm here and available to help it recognize, admit, make up for, and move on from the things it's done, you know, like a good father. Yeah. This yeah. country doesn't need a great white father anymore, you know, in the old language, like it needs a great red father, what it needs. <laughs> I'm not the person to do that. I'm not a politician. I, I should never run for office, but it needs somebody. You know, but maybe you or, can pave the way. Yeah, no, I, I get to be a writer and I get to sit around and just like think of things and then write them down and like make people mad. Like that's my job and I'm happy with my job. I'm good at it. <laughs> it's, you know, it works for me. You are. And I'm grateful for it. I'm really grateful for uh, the writing and the conversation and all the conversations that you've had that led to the writing and that informed the writing, which come to life and everything of yours that I've read and it brings people to life all around. And so, uh, you know, that word that you were just talking about restoring the possibility of restoring dignity. Generally, I think uh, dignity emerges from all of those conversations you have and the way those mm -hmm. people all show up. And it, so I just want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for everything you brought to the conversation tonight from Leech Lake. I know you're surrounded by family in your house and I really appreciate your taking the time uh, and really being present here. Um, I am hoping that we're gonna find a way in person to continue the conversation. Yeah, um, I'd love that, I really would. Yeah, and I do wanna say to viewers that we're about to turn over so that you can talk with each other with the help of my colleague, Roselle, uh, in very small groups about some of the ideas and questions that David has uh, raised and maybe made people mad, but maybe made people inspired. Every one of you is going to be able to talk about that. So um, I'm really hey, grateful David, for the chance to, to chat with you. Um, and um, But I'm also grateful for the people who, who have tuned into this thing and who are going to go have real conversations. Like that's that doesn't happen all that often, honestly, in, in the real world. Um, but you're doing it in the real world with the, one another. And I, I just think that's, that's very impressive and it's very encouraging. And I'm, I'm really grateful from my end. Thank you. We're, we're working on, I think we're working on culture, which is what I feel like I've been learning from reading your writing is what it is to work on culture. And so thank you for that. We're going to do that strange sign off on Zoom where we're here and then suddenly we're not. Um, yeah. Again, David, thank you. And to everyone thank watching, you. please switch over and yeah. Take care. All right, you too.